All right. Well, hey, everybody. Thank you for joining us for the uh, Adventures in Voice Acting panel. Uh, with me today are some guests from Bang Zoom Studios. This is AJ, who's a producer over at Bang Zoom and uh, also does a lot of casting for, uh, for the anime industry these days. We also have Erica. Erica, do you want to tell us a little bit about yourself and your background? Uh, yeah, I'm originally from Chicago. I've been living in LA for a little over 10 years now. Um, things you can do for me, and I'm Ryu going to Hill a Kill, I'm going to Hunter Hunter, uh, I'm going to get Impact, uh, I'm going to go Love Live, and uh, so on and so forth. Thank you for that, and then we also have Lucy. Go ahead and tell us a little bit about your name. Uh, sure, so uh, I'm originally from upstate New York, uh, I've been living in Los Angeles for a while now, so <laughs> a time. Uh, some of the stuff you may have heard me in, uh, Weaver Velvet in the Fate series, Akaza um, in Demon Slayer, Mojito in Jujutsu Kaisen, uh, Felix in Fire Emblem Three Houses, uh, Hif uh, yeah, Hifumi and Kibo in Don Norma series, uh, and that's it. <laughs> <laughs> and then AJ, tell us a little bit about your day-to-day -day, uh, casting for voice acting and working on the Um Primarily a project manager over at Bang Zoom, so and I've been doing this for like about a decade or so. So many titles that Eric and Lucian have worked on, such as um, Hunter Hunter, uh, Fate, um, a bunch of other stuff. Um, I actually assisted with managing the titles. So in terms of just like scheduling, making sure everything gets on Netflix in time, that kind of thing. Um, but in the casting aspect, um, I did do some. I did do some late casting on Hunter Hunter. Last year I worked on Tokyo 24th War, Rivers from Coil. Uh, I'm blanking right now. Um, I've also assisted with the upcoming game that's getting released later this year, Rain Code, um, from Spike Chunks Off, so. I need that. And if you hear anything that you said about it, feel free to let us know. Well, and so. Let's start there, because I know most of you, how many of you are interested in voice acting or want to know how to make your portfolios a little better? Want to know maybe some things to avoid as well and some of the, the rough knocks that we've had getting started? So let's let's start with, uh, AJ, tell me one of the most interesting adventures in, in voice acting you've seen as far as casting was. Um, I'm not going to give the title of mm -hmm. uh, what I saw, but once upon a time, I might have seen somebody do like a fandom of something on YouTube and I was like, oh, this is actually really interesting. Um, it sounded pretty good and when I looked into further, this person had actually already been taking classes, already working on their craft, already working on their resume, um, developing their own home studio. So, I thought, so it was one of those situations that I was like, okay, this person is maybe hasn't had their break in the industry, but then they're, they're, they've been preparing the tools to be able to um, present themselves professionally once the opportunity arose. So when I figured out that that was a, that was a thing, they, were like, they also had like an agent at that time, I think. I was like, okay, let me reach out to this person. We don't do this very often. A lot of the people that we work with, we've probably um, met through other connections, other directors, other actors that we've worked with. Um, for, but for this one specifically, because they, I could tell that they were working on their craft, that they were like building um, their resume, continuing to actually pursue this very seriously, I decided to give them a shot. They actually got a part in something. Oh, that's great. Um, I'm not going to be opening because it's still under NBA, but, you know. <laughs> That, that, that's basically for a lot of these panels where we're, we're not here for one particular studio with a, with a line. Uh, you're going to hear us say NDA all the time. It's all the <laughs> stuff we're working on, we're just not allowed to talk about it. Um, but, Erica, tell me about your first time uh, getting a role and what it took to prepare for that. Oh, uh, my first time getting a role, I think, was in this It's probably buried on YouTube somewhere. I'm sure people are going to try to look for it. But it was some. It was a like a compilation of uh, episodes that they turned into a movie for this anime based on Treasure Island. I don't know if you were on that oh, right here. Yeah. <laughs> but um, that was like my first ever thing. I think that I booked with Bang Zoom, and my first like big one of my first big professionals. I think I was working on Pac-Man. Yeah. Like, 
Yeah. So I was working on these like two things as like lead characters, which is pretty remarkable because like that doesn't happen to a lot of people. I had issues a bit here and there with Big Zoom. Um, and then they're like, oh, you can do boy voices. All right, cool. We're gonna throw you in as every little boy for like the next year. Um, <laughs> She's very good. <laughs> For situations like that, even if you're like shy, uh, introverted, you if it's something you really want to do, you're gonna like try your hardest to get it done. So that's kind of what I did. I, I pushed myself, surprised myself a lot, surprised other people I think. Um, yeah, kind of the rest is history and I think it's better from there. And Lucy, what about your first time? Oh uh, well my first role in anime specifically was actually on the Pokemon. Pokemon series. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, it's a little guest role, uh, gym leader, kind of referee, but uh, named uh, Marin. Uh, and I remember I was still living in, well, I, so I just, I said I, I lived in upstate New York. Uh, and I moved to the city at some point because I knew I, I was working on my craft and I knew I wanted to do this. And I knew, well, I can't work as a voice actor here in any extended capacity, unless I'm going to do the occasional local commercial and I don't know, radio tag or something that I can scrounge up, uh, again, in the area. But it was just never going to be enough. It wasn't going to be the stuff that I wanted to do, which was character work and to work uh, on anime, because I was a fan of anime. So I you know, saved up a bunch of money, I moved to the city, got a crappy <laughs> apartment, uh, like I think most artists do uh, when they first move to a new place, just to get situated. And luckily, I had already been kind of putting my voice together on like a CD and putting together a little demo reel of sorts. And I had been sending that out uh, preemptively to a bunch of the studios in New York City thinking, well, I don't know, maybe by the time I get there, something will happen and I'll, I'll just get the ball rolling. Um, so I've been living in New York City for about a month and I got a call from the recording studio that worked on Pokemon. And they said, hey, uh, we, uh, we got your CD and we listened to it and we, we thought it was really great and we have this little role, we're wondering if you'd be interested. Uh, <laughs> we're wondering if you'd be interested in working on Pokemon. <laughs> <laughs> no, screw you guys. <laughs> <laughs> of course, I was like, uh, of course. Yes, I'd love to come in. I can make some time on my schedule for that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> So yeah, we hashed out the details, and I was so excited because this was just like uh, the, the biggest thing I'd ever uh, worked on by far. It was, it was so exciting. I remember getting off the phone with the person. Uh, I remember I just gotten off the subway on my flip phone at the time. Like, okay, then, thank you very much. Yeah, I'll see you there. You know, it's Wednesday, three o'clock. Great. Thank you very much. And I hang up, and then I just I kind of stare at it for a moment, and then I just. Leap into the air and say, Yes! <laughs> yes, I did it! Oh, uh, yeah, so it was very exciting. That's my first first <laughs> Excellent. Well, and so location seems to be really important. It's weird in this day where we think Zoom and everything else is going to make it, make it work, but how important is being in the city, being in New York or being in LA to starting your career? Um, let's ask AJ first. Um. I will say, it is a little bit different nowadays just because with the past couple of years we have opened a lot of, um, we've had a lot of opportunity to work with people not necessarily here near the studio, um, but these are with people who uh, have probably been doing their thing for a little bit, they have their own home studios, they have a professional home studio that they can actually connect with. Um, so. Uh, being in LA is definitely helpful, especially if we're not necessarily familiar with you or if you don't have your own home studio. Um, I don't think it's 1000% necessary, but certainly helps. And we, with everything kind of opening up a little bit more often nowadays, um, we actually do have a lot more people coming into studio because that is certain shows or certain 
producers actually may require that for that show. So especially if you're breaking in, having so having more visibility, having access to um, being in the area and to more studios is probably more helpful. Um, it is not going to a thousand percent guarantee anything, yeah. but it definitely helps. Well, I mean, just just from seeing the ensembles come together, you really can't beat having everybody get around, not on Zoom, being able to jam back and forth about how we're going to do the voices, how we're going to do the dialogue, and have the director sort of guide them through that process. And um, you know, location is important for that, especially when you're starting off your career. I think it's funny that uh, the CEO for Bang Zoom was from New York as well, from upstate New York as well, and had to come to Los Angeles to sort of get things rolling. Um, Erica, do you want to tell us a little bit about both location and equipment and how much of a difference that makes for your process of craft? Yeah, definitely echoing a lot of what AJ said. Um, for, it's, I guess it's a little different, I guess, for us because we are, we've already been in LA, we've been in LA for a pretty long time. Um, I guess the, the main thing is, like, I, I think it's, it is really important to kind of station somewhere where voice acting is a hub because, it, yes, while remote opportunities are more accessible at this point, um, there are a lot of people that were getting those remote opportunities that are now moving to Los Angeles mm -hmm. because I think they realize that. It's a lot of what's available is anime, so I guess if you only want to work on anime for the rest of your life, <laughs> sure, I guess. But if you're trying to be a voice actor, you want to do whatever you can. And uh, like as AJ said, a lot of the places um, that were doing remote for a time are now um, sometimes requiring people to come in, or like greatly prefer people to come in because. At the end of the day, like remote recording is cool and all, it gives a lot of more people opportunities, but it's really hard on the production side. Um, engineers have a really hard time with it. They have to work like three times as hard to get everything to sound the same. Like people are recording in the same area, basically. Because um, while you may have a good professional studio and have spent like thousands of dollars on equipment, it's not going to sound the same as somebody recording in an actual recording room. Yeah. At the end of the day. And we also want our actors to be able to kind of focus on their performance as much as possible. We don't want you guys to be worrying about like, am I, am I riding the main too high, or am I clipping, or stuff like that. Like, it's much, we have wonderful engineers at the studio who make sure that everything we're getting is super good, so whenever we have that opportunity. Yeah, that was, that was really the high point of getting to go back into studio <laughs> so is not having to like, ride my levels to, like, if I was getting too loud, you know, I have to turn my levels down, but sometimes it's not down enough because I'm not an engineer and I don't know how that works, so I can only guess. And then I'd still like peak the the performance, like so it, it would get distorted and unusable basically. So then I have to turn down even lower, and sometimes lower, and sometimes lower, and it's it's a pain in the butt. So it's it's it is nice not to have to think about stuff like that. Yeah. Lucy, do you have anything you want to add to that as well? Oh, uh, not too much. I guess you know. Even though it doesn't come up super frequently, and another thing that um, if you're recording remotely you may not have access to is uh, ensemble sessions, where you know, for whatever reason uh, they they felt it's important to have all the actors together in a single room to play off of each other. Um, I'm actually working on something right now that's uh, for that BZ uh, has been recording uh, and NDA as usual, um, <laughs> but uh, again it's like. A bunch of us, um, you know, recording at the same time, uh, and that's just not something that would have been available um, if uh, I was in another state. Uh, so that's another benefit to being where <laughs> where the work is being recorded. Oh, I was gonna say, I was gonna one more thing. There's also the nice aspect of like for us, we live pretty close to being Zoom. So if we're ever having technical difficulties on a remote session, we can just drive like 10 minutes to the studio and be like, okay, we're, we're good now. <laughs> well, not everyone has that luxury. Not everyone. Right? <laughs> I would say for us in particular and maybe some other people, but yeah. yeah. But um, so going from there, for people that want to get a, into voice acting, they want to have these adventures of their own, what do you think is the most important thing for them to focus on? Is it equipment? Is it practice? Is it working with other people? AJ, we'll start with you. Um, I think that depending on where you are um, in your journey, if you're literally just starting out, take acting classes. At the end of the day, even if you have 
a really unique voice, even if you can, or even if you can mimic somebody else's voices perfectly, that's great and all, but you need to be able to perform in that voice, and you need to be able to make sure that you sustain that voice for at least two hours, because whenever we book you guys, it's always going to be like a two-hour minimum. It's kind of like our standard rates. So in order for us to be able to make sure that you're castable, we need to make sure that you can sustain it and, and that you can do that for that duration. Um, and also, even if you are performing already, um, still continue to take classes. You might learn something new from improv that you can bring into anime. It's not very often that you do, but then sometimes <laughs> it happens. Um, equipment is something that is definitely helpful. Um, eventually, at some point, when you feel like a little bit more comfortable or where, with where you're at in your journey. But at the beginning, classes. Classes, 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 study, and network. And Erica? Yeah, echoing AJ again, uh, classes are definitely important even if you are a working professional. I think it's always good to like touch up on your skills or like, I learn new things all the time. I feel like when I'm in a booth working with either, you know, other actors or other directors even. Um, and sometimes you, just, like even you'll come up with something and you're like, oh, wait, let me, I need to figure out a way to tap into that more. So maybe you take classes or um, private lessons even. Uh, to kind of like focus on that and like learn how to control that part of your voice better or um, enhance it even. Um, other things, I think it's also pretty important to like um, realize that, not, uh, I, I'm definitely a special case kind of based off what I was saying uh, before, that uh, not everybody, you know, you don't just get to take classes and start working automatically, you know, for a lot of people it takes many, many, many years. There are a few exceptions, obviously, as I was saying, but um, it, it's, I think it's important to just kind of like not give up um, because it could take a while for you. The, and it's not even necessarily because you're bad. It just, it's not the right time and they're not looking for somebody like you or they already have people like you, but maybe in like a few years, they won't and some, something will click and then you'll start working maybe, you know. It, it's all, it's so hard to like assess and like determine uh, how your career is going to go, really. Lucian, what do you think? Uh, yeah, I agree with all of that. Um, also, kind of uh, bundling into what we were talking about as far as being where the work is uh, versus remote, I think another nice thing about, say, living in a place like Los Angeles is um, taking, taking classes with the people who actually work um, all the time in this area. So. I mean, I, I remember taking classes with Charlie Adler and, and you know, the private uh, lesson with Ginny McSwain. These are some of the you know, best people who work in animation, uh, not even necessarily anime, just animation, um, acting. And that's an opportunity that would not have uh, been available you know, back in New York. Sure. So moving, moving to Los Angeles, studying with, yeah, the people who know their stuff. Uh, and I think the other nice thing is Taking workshops, yes, to, to hone your craft, certainly, but also to develop um, kind of a little network and a community of other up-and-coming voice actors who share the same interests and passion as you do, and then you can kind of help each other out. Uh, I've certainly owed a lot of leads or, or even jobs that I've had from friends of mine who are coming up in the voice acting world who uh, said, oh, hey, uh, this person would be, you know, Lucian would be really good for this, um, and pitched me to so-and-so, and I've done the same for other people. Um, so I think that's another great benefit uh, to, you know, really just, just studying, taking workshops, and even, I think, uh, you know, something that I, I haven't done in a long time, but I used to just get friends together, get colleagues together, and we would read scripts. Literally, we'd just say, okay, we're gonna read this uh, transcript from, uh, you know, whatever anime, you know, Rock My One Half or whatever it was. Uh, and okay, so, uh, you know, Lucian, you're gonna be, uh, you know, uh, Kuno, and, and, you know, okay, uh, Kyle, you're gonna be Ranma, Male Ramen, and so and so. And we would just read the script, uh, just for fun, not even like, Putting it on for show just for just for practice, or I'd put on an anime DVD with subtitles uh, with friends and be like, okay, so and then we cast it and then just perform the whole thing, just just for fun. And I think uh, that kind of 
practice uh, community building is really valuable. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Well, and I saw somebody had a question. Maybe now's yeah. a good time I'll to open up the questions. Yeah, both of us do. Oh, yeah. so let me uh, grab a question and I'll come okay. here. Go ahead. Uh, do you have any recommendations for places to take classes, such as like community college, Udemy, actually finding somebody and kidnapping them? We don't have a question that last one. Probably the Community college is probably a good place to start just because like voice acting is acting, so you don't just want to take voiceover classes. I think acting classes are pretty beneficial as well. Um, there's all sorts of like networks online. Um, there's this thing called this vo the Voice Over Resource Guide that has a bunch of um, information in there, which will have like studios that do classes, um, make Zoom classes. Yeah, we um, have yeah, Tony Oliver um, and a bunch of teachers now. Actually. Yeah, they have like a whole. We have like a they have like a whole like teaching staff. You know? There's like Tony Oliver, Julie Madalena, I think Greg Chen did like a did like a live action ADR class. Um, but definitely, uh, even theater classes is really good because one of the things that I love about theater actors who come into voices, <laughs> even if they're not like really great at sync at the beginning, at least you know they know how to like support and project, and you know what you're gonna get from them is like at least you know good quality, clear sound. So that's a really good starting point because sometimes even people don't know how to like necessarily project once they have like a mic in front of them. So just those kinds of techniques you can get from like all different sorts of acting classes. Yeah, do you have anything you want to add? Uh, also improv. Uh, is, I, don't I, I don't have any specific ones to recommend, but if I get, I would assume if you Google improv <laughs> Los Angeles or whatever your area is, uh, you might be able to find something. Uh, improv is can be really useful for thinking on your feet, because oftentimes we go into the studio and we're, we have to create characters literally in seconds sometimes, uh, and we're seeing a script for the first time, and we have to make choices, uh, and make, yeah, just light and fast choices as a performer. Yeah. So improv can be very useful when it comes to that. Um, and jumping on something, uh, when you mentioned improv, a lot of voice actors have said that that's in their repertoire already, that that's sort of where they got their entry. I know that Saba was talking a lot about that when he was prepping for Dragon Ball Z. But uh, as well as um, you had mentioned earlier, Tony Oliver. For those who don't know, Tony Oliver was, is an amazing voice actor. He's out of Los Angeles, and he, he did everything from RoboTech to Matt Cross and just just tons of stuff. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, but when it comes to somebody who can pull a performance out, if you can get classes with them, and they're actually fairly easy to get, they're out of Burbank. I think is where he's doing most of his classes. He has first ones online. Highly recommend looking into Tony Oliver. He's basically work with everybody in the industry. Adventures in voice acting. What was that? <laughs> I think it's currently called Adventures in voice acting. Oh, is it? Okay. So, maybe, maybe, maybe we should go. <laughs> All right, go right ahead. Yeah, um, first question, do any of you know Monica Riol? And the second one, why is it that in anime, um, it's altered um, or censored compared to the Japanese version? Um, like, in the original Sailor Moon, I think you should know this, Erica, um, Neptune. Uh, how many of us know what Neptune and Uranus were in the original one? <laughs> And, um, well, they fixed that. Yeah, thank you, Erica. And um, they changed like rice balls and Pokemon too. Jelly-filled donuts. <laughs> Why is that? Um, a lot of that has to do with like the societal norms at the, the time that those are done, like and who the the show is marketed to. Pokemon at the time was marketed towards kids, and I guess the people doing it didn't think that kids knew what rice balls were in America. Um, I think stuff like that is becoming. Uh, less and less at this point. Like uh, like we were saying, Sailor Moon uh, was redubbed and mm -hmm. the relationship of Uranus and Neptune was changed. That wasn't my decision, that was uh, somebody else's decision from Viz, who does the, um, the anime. And um, they, yeah, they're just like, well, you know, we, we want to bring this as, as true as we can um, within, you know, reason. And some things still get changed here and there, but you know, I think it's it's kind of like up to who is producing it at the time and what Japan thinks a lot of the time too. Because a lot of stuff is changing. And and also a lot of where it's going to um, also affects kind of how much needs to be changed. Um, like for example, if you think about a show that's going to be on like Disney Kids or something like that or Disney XD. Um, they uh, every 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 major like broadcasting 
network has like their certain broadcast standards and practices that certain things will end up getting like a certain kind of like PG rating. So sometimes our our concept of that rating is different from what comes from Japan originally. So sometimes we have to actually make those kinds of adjustments in order to make sure that we're within the rating that our client wants to be able to kind of um, stay within. Like for example, um, we work on the Beyblade series. Uh, that's also one thing. Uh, but uh, one of the things that we are very conscientious about is that we can't have kids, uh, the characters, feel like, sound like they're in a lot of pain. So anytime somebody gets like hit or something like that, we actually have to kind of tone down how much pain they're taking. We have to change the sound effects a little bit. We have to put in like a goofy sound effect in order to make sure these kids know, yeah, they're falling from the sky, but don't worry, it's okay. <laughs> also, don't recommend this at home. Please do not do it to the and jump out of it. So those are the kinds of messages that we have to kind of consider when we're localizing. Um, also when we write, because Erica and Lucian also um, do adaptation. Okay, do any of you know Monica Real? Um, that was the first one. Yeah, kind of. <laughs> I haven't had the opportunity to work with her personally, but we've had we've had her in a couple times. Yeah. Uh, go ahead. Uh, how difficult is it to pursue opportunities in voice acting when you already have full time for you? And then when you see that thing that you're done. So, just to repeat the, the question, maybe, how feasible is it to go into voice acting when you have a full time career that is not related to the same? Depends on how flexible your job is sometimes. Yeah. I know a lot of people have had either full time or part time jobs. Um, I, I had a, a fairly full time job, I think, when I was first starting out. And um, luckily, I was able to work with my employer, and they would let me take certain days off if I was like, hey, I need you know this time off if I was given enough notice for it. So that worked out for me. Um, but eventually, I think, you know. You do kind of have to wean off of the job if you feel comfortable enough to do so. But I wouldn't do it until you feel comfortable enough to do so. Like I had a pretty big nest egg um, that I had saved up, so I was able to quit my full-time job and do full-time voiceover. But full-time voiceover does not mean you're working every day. So that's why you have to have a lot of savings behind that because you could only be working once once a week, you know, once a month. Hopefully that's enough to pay your rent, but who knows? <laughs> well, then, Lucian, what do you think about this? Um, yeah, I think I think it's really tough. I I, I don't I wouldn't say it's impossible for sure. Um, but I just think you know, voice acting it's it's a very it's very rewarding, but it's a very challenging industry to get into, and it takes a lot of uh, time and money, you know, to to uh, prepare yourself. Um, and to even get to the point where you're working at any level at all, um, it takes a long time. So you have to be able to invest um, a fair amount of time and resources uh, into doing it. So um, certainly, if you're working full time, you will have, you know, be able to fund <laughs> your passion. That, that's nice for that. But yeah, it does come a point, and it's very difficult, um, if not impossible, to say unequivocally at what point you know you should definitely stop <laughs> uh, quit your full-time job and go into voiceover it's kind of uh, you gotta kind of go by your gut and it takes a little bit of faith as well um, that's the tricky thing well and jumping into that like how often do you get calls that the director or somebody saying hey we were your agent and saying we need you to audition now that would interrupt a, a normal job like how, how often <laughs> too often <laughs> I've asked these people to turn around auditions within less than 24 hours. I'm sorry, by the way. It happens. It's kind of be ready for it. Yeah. But I mean, if you work the nine to six, our nine to six is is recording. So if you can't make it during those hours, it might be a little bit difficult for you. Yeah, that's why I said like yeah. if you do try to make it work. It's it's very important that your your full time employer like understands that and you're able to be flexible with it. So. All right, any other questions? Oh, I'll jump All right, we'll start with you, and we'll work on it. All right, here. Uh, yeah, so I've been doing voice acting for about a year now, and I've gotten a lot of stuff in like commercials and live action dubbing. But I've been wanting to make that transition into animations and, um, yeah, getting into either anime or animation. And I was wondering, what was your guys' um, thoughts on how you made that transition? 
as well as what's your thoughts on, um, I've heard mixed things about getting an animation demo these days, like paying to have an animation demo made, and I've heard mixed things about the value of that, so I wanted to know your guys' thoughts on that. Well, I've got a bunch of questions with that. <laughs> I'm, can, I, can I just ask, uh, yeah. to follow up, well, what are, I'm curious, what, what are some of the um, concerns, that the negatives uh, you've been told about getting an animation demo? Yeah, um, I recently took a class, like two weeks ago, with a um, casting director, she was saying that, uh, Hearing the produced um, like animation demos that like people are paying to get made doesn't give her a very good. Um, it, there's not much value to it. She wants to hear how you audition, and like just hearing raw reads. She was like, I want to hear more samples of how you audition without like music and producing on it versus hearing something produced. The, the thing is, every person you talk to about that's going to have a different opinion. So yeah. it depends on the casting yeah. director. Well, AJ, when, you, when you're casting, do you, would you prefer hearing demos that are overly produced, almost like an audio book, where they have the background sounds and everything else, or do you prefer hearing the raw voice? Um, I definitely think, personally, personally, um, some sound effects here and there, maybe a little bit, just to like kind of accentuate some of the dialogue that you're saying, especially if it's like a, com if there's like certain aspects of comedy to it, it helps a little bit, but the main focus is going to be your voice and the characters that you can do. So you want to make sure that it's not, a, or personally, I think it's more effective when I can focus on the characters um, and kind of what kind of range that you're able to do. Because if I can't tell that and all I'm hearing is like explosions and stuff like that, it doesn't really help me too, too much. Well, what are some common mistakes, and I'll start with it, Erica, that, that you've heard or you've seen other people come in with that end up getting flipped on their ear completely? Somebody maybe sticks to one voice for seven different takes or something like that. Uh, well, yeah, that is one thing. Like you need to know how to give different takes because most of the time when you're working, you will be asked to do like at least two takes, if not three takes. You have to have like that's kind of I guess where improv would come in too. You have to have that ability to um, do different reads of a particular line. So uh, I, I guess the where the person was telling you, like, they want to hear how you audition, I think uh, that would come into play because um, if it's just like a static demo, you could work on that demo for like two days and been like really focusing on every particular line to make it exactly perfect. Um, whereas you don't get that opportunity necessarily in like an actual session or, or during an audition because sometimes but those auditions go real fast and you have to turn them in real quick. So you don't get a lot of time to think about it. Um, Oh, yeah. Yeah, no, I was going to say, I saw Lucian's eyes get up. <laughs> right in front of it, like, I've got a story. Oh, my God. <laughs> Tell us your story. What do you think about this? Oh, well, so, yeah, as far as demos go, I, my, my personal opinion is, yes, I, I don't think you should cover up your performance um, to compensate yeah. with a lot of flashy effects or whatever. But I do think there is merit to, um, I, I think, when a, if a producer is listening to your demo, they want to get a sense for, like, you know, would their voice fit into the world of this animated series or, you know, this world? And so if you have the accompanying kind of, you know, a music track or something so that it sounds like, oh yeah, um, it sounds like that voice is coming from an actual produced show, um, and, I, and it's believable, uh, I think there's merit to that. For me, I think more often, I, I would actually flip it on its head, I think more often than doing one voice, five times in your demo. I think a common mistake I hear is people who try to do too much, um, who try to show off, you know, oh, here's 20 different voices, wacky voices that I can do, and maybe four of those are, like, decent, and the rest are kind of, you know, need, need more work. Um, or, uh, I'm, I mean, I'm reminded of, uh, there's a, one of the premier legendary voice actors, um, Barbera and a slew of classic characters is a gentleman named Dawes Butler. Uh, and he taught a host of students, and what he always passed on was, you know, it's, these aren't just voices, these are characters. And so sometimes what I'm hearing um, in someone's first attempts, few attempts at a demo, is, you know, they're trying to wow you with, you know, all, all the different things they can do with their voice. Here's a crow, and here's, and it's really silly, here's my other silly voice, but there's no real uh, foundation there. There's no actual 
character that, that feels believable. So I think as opposed to going wild and trying to show off like how many different voices you can do, do like four or five that you've really worked on um, and showcase that first and we'll make sure that that feels like a fully fleshed out character, not just a voice. Thanks. Well then let's go back to some of our questions. Uh, you had a question, go right ahead. Yes. Um, so, Eric, I think you mentioned uh, full-time voice acting, and you might only be working one day a week. What do you do for the other days a week? I sit in my condo and I cry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, honestly, I have the luxury of being uh, pretty financially stable. I'm not like rich or anything, but I'm comfortable with where I am. So, if I'm not answering emails about potential other work during that week or that month or whatever, I'm honestly just playing video games, which has kind of been a way research, I guess. I don't know. That's what I tell myself. Yes. But, um, yeah, I, I, I feel like signing up for class. I want to sign up for more classes usually, but they go so fast these days because a lot of people have access to them. So, I, I, I would be taking more classes, but I just have not been able to jump on the gun. Um, to be able to do that, but, uh, but yeah, that's probably what I, I should be doing and I would be doing if I had the, <laughs> the ability to do so, but um, that's definitely what I would suggest. Uh, so. well, well, AJ, to, to follow up on that, for those voice actors that are working one day, two days a week, what do you think they should be doing now? Get your attention. <laughs> Don't be me. Listen to AJ. No, no, be me. No. That's good. You play video games. But like, in all seriousness, playing video games, watching media and stuff, that is research. That is legitimate research that you can be doing. Find out who, who are these people, what are they doing, what have they been working on. Try and find out what was their, what was their kind of like route into this industry and maybe you can pick up on like what kind of classes they took. So doing your research, doing your research, taking classes, workshops, working on your networking. Um, I've I recently had um, a show that I was working on and I needed to audition this one character and it's a very unique character. And so I sent it to like, uh, normally we send it to like a number of people in our database. Um, and when I sent it out, they were like, oh, you should try this person because um, I actually, like I'm very honored to be able to audition for this, but at the same time, I think this person would be great. And I listened to it and I was like, they're right. I've, I didn't realize this person could do that. So networking is actually really important. Just being able to continuously like put yourself in, in places where you have more access to those opportunities, whether it's classes, networking, that kind of stuff. Okay, so, all right, let's go back to the floor. Question back here. Two questions. Um, when you do an audition, if they don't specify the amount of takes that they want, how many do you give them? And second question, how often do you work union versus non-union? Two, two very good questions. I'll repeat those. The first one is when they don't specify how many takes, how many should the voice actor be submitting? And the second one is how often is it union versus non-union right now in the industry? AJ, I think you're best suited for this. <laughs> uh, so in terms of number of takes, I, I would say for something specifically anime-wise, um, we usually want to make sure that we're as loyal to the source material as possible. So, in terms of variety of voices, you're probably not going to have too, too many. So, and also, we probably don't have a lot of time to listen to like four or five different takes on a character. So maybe just like a couple that you're really comfortable with. The biggest thing from these um, auditions that we want to make sure that you are able to perform um, and just kind of like whether or not your voice is somewhat close to the original source material. Um, and in terms of, that said, if it's original animation, if you have more ideas, we always welcome it, but at the same time, you kind of got to cherry pick which ones you're willing to Usually, like, like they, yeah. usually they'll say two, yeah. like two or three. Two or three. Yeah. yeah, two or three. More than that, I'm kind of like, does this person not know <laughs> what they want to do? In which case, then, yeah, um, well, kind of like confidence level as well. And to follow up with that, how important is it for somebody to absorb with the time that they have, especially if it's AJ that's uh, giving out the call and says you have 12 hours to get me uh, some, some things, uh, how important is it that they have the character in mind and to carry that character through in 
their takes? Um, well, 1,000% important. Um, that said, uh, usually I can probably tell within like the first couple of lines whether or not the voice is right for the character. Um, usually our audition files are maybe like 30 seconds to a minute long. They're pretty short. Um, it's just a few lines because we really don't have a lot of time and a lot of the, turn the, the turnaround in the industry is pretty fast. So within the first couple of lines I can tell, okay, this person is kind of within the range. And I, rest, I listen to the rest of the audition in order to make sure that your performance can carry throughout. So I, that's how I kind of like lean it out. I, I pick the ones whose first lines impress me, and then I listen to the rest just to make sure that they're still, that they're able to consistently carry it. Excellent. And then uh, as far as the union question, how many productions right now, especially in the anime space, are you seeing SAG at the union versus uh, non-union? I feel like we've had a lot of union nowadays. Um, anime Once Upon a Time is like predominantly non-union, um, and we still have some titles that are non-union, but I feel like there's been a lot more movement recently in order to get things unionized, because we want to make sure that we're taking care of our actors when we need help in the country. So it's great that we're able to give these people these opportunities. <laughs> Oh man, speaking of agents and producers, 
my EP is over there looking at me going, Sean, do not talk about taxes. It's not your area. It's pretty creative. Um, and, and sometimes that's probably the best thing is that have a good advisor, have somebody that has been with other voice actors, knows your industry, can help advise in that scope. And um, you know, don't ask the other artists because they'll tell you what you can write off, but they won't necessarily tell you what you should file to the IRS. Verbal <laughs> <laughs> tax. <laughs> I was wondering like how one would go about getting into your database like do you need to take classes or, how, or at what point do you need to be to sort of start getting seen I don't know um, a lot of people that we work with are in our database because somebody else recommended them okay. so a lot of again a lot of people who teach a lot of um, other voice directors other agents even um, we've had agents come to us and be like hey we represent this person, they're a little bit newer, they've only been doing like maybe commercials or something like that, but they're really interested in anime and they want to break into that, so please consider them. Um, so if you have an agent, that's actually a really great way to kind of break into it because they know they should be able to connect to casting directors as needed. Um, but again, yeah, workshops, classes, um, get in front of other casting directors, get in front of other voice directors because maybe They'll be working on a show that needs something, and it turns out exa you're exactly what they need. Thank you. Yeah. Then we had one more question over here. Yeah. Go right ahead. Uh, two quick things. Uh, actual question I have is uh, regarding mocap and the advances that are being made in mocap now. Um, how, as voice actors, are you finding that audition process playing out? Is it pretty similar, or do you feel it's a little bit easier adjusting to like not just doing the voice, but wanting to act out and being actually being more accurate than just doing the voice. And the second thing, um, from an IRS tax, the <laughs> 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 so figurine is a great uh, question. You can actually do that as long as you have things like WonderCon where you can use it as a marketing material. Say, hey, I've got a booth. This is the character I play. And justify it. <laughs> 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 so, so are you a CPA or do you want to Because you're not going to have a line of questions. <laughs> Super alien to me. Uh, as far as you know, is it? I wouldn't. I definitely wouldn't say it's easier. Um, I, there's more I have to uh, worry about as far as like, okay, what's what's the lighting like and the, the angle and what am I what am I even doing with my face? What, what is that thing? And, um, things I don't normally have to uh, pay attention to when I'm uh, just voice acting. Sometimes I have to memorize the script, which you don't have to do in voiceover. Um, so it's definitely more challenging, but I'm asked to from not too often, but uh, I'll get auditions from my agent from time to time for mocap. And if it's not super arduous, then I'll be like, okay, I'll give it a shot. Um, but it, it always feels a little bit of a stretch from what I normally do in my in and out uh, you know, work as a voice actor. I don't. I like actually try to avoid those as much as possible. <laughs> I, I don't like recording myself, and I don't ever know where my arms are 
AJ, how much how much mocap is going through Bang Zoom right now? I know. Uh, we've actually worked on a number of titles for mocap. Um, I'm liking on them right now. Um, but I think we did like a Resident Evil at one point. Um, mm -hmm. But what, what I mean, go, doing mocap is literally is legit. Your film, you're you're pretty much on stage. The only thing that you don't have is like the hair and makeup and special effects makeup and stuff like that if you're doing something crazy. Except you have the, the funny little balls all over your suit. So it's it's a full it's it's pretty much acting on camera. The only difference I say is that um, we do have a lot of uh, whenever we report we film the mocap we actually bring the actors in afterwards in order to do a lot of ADR to the stuff that they were um, filming once upon a time just for like clarity purposes. I feel like we that also happens a lot in live action, but because um, in li in live action production, but then for mocap specifically, because it's in video games, we're a little bit more particular about like the quality and cleanliness of the sound, so we end up actually doing a lot of ADR um, on that end as well. So if you're doing just, um, I don't know if this is how all mocap um, is done, but the one, but the number of titles that we've done at the studio, <laughs> they've done the filming and then we actually brought them back and pretty much re-recorded the entire thing uh, in the studio. So we're going to have one more question. No compound questions, just one good question. <laughs> just, let's see here. Yeah, let's make that one. Gentlemen in the blue, uh, Decepticon jersey. Nice. <laughs> uh, so I'm curious, has it ever been, have you ever seen a, a case that maybe a voice actor has a, 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 wants to learn Japanese or a, a real strong uh, appreciation of Japanese culture uh, in some way is able to help with and also learn something? The, uh, the transition process. Interesting question. So uh, I'm going to repeat it. Uh, I'm going to try to paraphrase what you're saying. Have you found a, a, a place where an American or, or uh, English speaking voice actor has either learned Japanese or that Japanese helped in the translation process and helped them be a better voice actor for the piece that they were working on? Um, uh, I'll just I'll start with Lucian and Erica. Do you find language helps or gets in the way? Uh, so I'm, I'm by no means fluent in Japanese. However, because I have, you know, for, for years I watched a lot of anime in Japanese, and so I can pick up a lot on certain words uh, and what they mean. So that is helpful when you're dubbing, because uh, typically all they do is they'll preview the scene, you know, the line that you're going to record. So if I can sort of follow along, go, okay, so that's where that hits, and then Okay, there's the pause, and then he says that. Okay, I know, I know that word, and that that comes at this point. That sort of helps me time out where the stuff is supposed to go in the performance. So in that sense, uh, yeah, it is it is similar. Yeah, I would I would definitely agree. I feel like it's helped me more with script adaptation though, because um, there are times when sometimes the person. Uh, who is doing the spotting on the script, who basically takes the translation and times it all out for you. So then when you're given it to adapt, sometimes things will be placed a little weird and not in the exact time code that it should be in. So my like very small uh, understanding of Japanese has helped me in that aspect to kind of like actually figure out where things go or if like seem, things seem weird with the translation a little bit, I can kind of like look at it and be like, I don't think this is right. Can I get a second opinion on that? hey, is this correct? Because I don't think it is, because I think they're actually talking about this. And I'd be like, oh yeah, that's right. Or like, oh no, this is actually like, this means this in this context. Excellent. Well, and, and I think we're going to have to cut there. Thank you all for joining us. This afternoon.